welcome to another episode of the Health Notebook. Today we're discussing arrhythmias and we have Dr. Gopal in the studio. Dr. Gopal, welcome. Assalamu um, alaikum Zia Chukran, once again for the invitation. It's a pleasure having you at the studio. Yeah. Um, just to recap and inform the viewers, you a cardiologist, uh, you practice uh, in the northern suburbs in Cape Town and you specialize in the rhythm abnormalities of the heart. Is That's correct, yes. Okay. Uh, we're discussing rhythm abnormalities or arrhythmias. Um, in, in just in a few words, firstly, explain to the viewers what a arrhythmia is, just to get their mind thinking. Okay. So uh, for an arrhythmia to develop, um, the heart actually needs to have a defective flow of electricity. Uh, essentially, every heartbeat starts off with the fact that we have a measured, seamless, regular flow of electricity uh, or electrical impulses. And these electrical impulses will then subsequently lead to coordinated muscle contraction, what we refer to as a heartbeat. Okay. Any defect or abnormality in that flow of electricity, uh, or let's call it a short circuit, so let's say the impulse itself gets blocked along the pathway, or alternatively the impulse repeats itself a number of times in the pathway, may lead to some form of short circuit. And that short, short circuit is referred to as an arrhythmia. Okay, I'm just going to go a little bit back to basics. So we're speaking about the heart here. Just uh, give the viewers ex some idea of how the heart is structured and where does the electrical wiring system come from and how does the heart actually beat? Okay, so I think that's an excellent question. The heart, as we are aware, is a, is a muscle pump, uh, essentially divided up into four chambers, two upper chambers and two lower chambers. Okay. Uh, and embedded within this muscle tissue in highly specialized insulated nerve fibers lies the electrical system of the heart. The electrical system of the heart originates in the body's own natural pacemaker, also known as the sinoatrial node, which is found within the right atrium. And when we have an electrical circuit or electrical impulse which flows from this natural pacemaker, it then goes on to cause the two upper chambers to contract also known as atrial depolarization. Uh, these signals then converge on a very specialized structure or nervous uh, bundle, also called the atrioventricular node, by which the signals are then processed and then transferred to the two lower chambers, which we know are called the ventricles. The electrical flow down the circuit then causes the uh, coordinated contraction of these chambers, which we call a heartbeat. Okay, so we have a small structure within the heart that fires or sends electrical impulses and that actually causes a heartbeat. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, does a fast heartbeat is or is a fast heartbeat classified as a arrhythmia or just give us your, your, okay. your take on a fast heart? Okay. So um, first of all, um, let's just go on to the basic definitions that we use. Uh, a faster heartbeat than normal is referred to uh, in medical terms as a tachycardia okay. uh, and would exceed a pulse rate of 90 beats per minute. Uh, any pulse rate which is within the 60 to 90 beats per minute range is regarded as a normal pulse rate. Let's say your normal resting pulse rate is 72 beats per minute and a pulse rate below uh, 60 beats per minute may be referred to as a bradycardia. We're referring to the faster pulse rates or the tachycardias. These may then originate from within your own nervous system uh, and we all experience fast heartbeats from time to time. Uh, the classical flight or, or fright uh, reflex uh, when we are afraid or when we are anxious or when we may have a temperature uh, or for example uh, conditions where our iron levels may be low known as anemia. These may all cause a fast heart rate. Uh, but these heart rates are still following that normal circuit of electrical activity uh, within that highly specialized conduction system. When we have fast heart rates starting to develop because of defects in that electrical flow, uh, either by way of an extra additional fiber or by way of a short circuit within the normal fibers of the heart, those are then referred to as a pathological tachycardia for which there are a number of causes. Okay. Uh, so you can also 
you can also exercise in however fast heartbeat as well, and that would be perfectly normal. Absolutely, that okay. would be normal, and it would be the body's uh, normal response to the fact that you require an increased supply of blood and oxygen to okay. the muscles. Okay. And when you mean an extra fiber within the heart, can you interpret that as a additional wire within the heart that's firing? You, I think so. You could either uh, regard it as an additional, uh, let's say, focus or spot which may be firing, and that's classically called uh, an atrial or ventricular focus, uh, but that may just be a small bundle of specialized nervous tissue which is depolarizing or firing much faster than the rest of the heart. In the heart, the most dominant or the fastest, uh, uh, let's say, pacemaker is always the one which will come out on top. So if your own heart rate is 72 beats per minute and you have a focus of electrical tissue, an aberrant focus within the atria or the ventricles which are beating at 140 a minute, the only thing that you'll see is the 140 a minute because it is overriding the normal slow 72 beats per minute. But with regards to the additional wire, uh, so that may, rather than it be firing, it may also be connecting a chamber abnormally because okay. we know know that the impulse has got to follow this very dedicated specialized tissue and when it is able to find an additional circuit and that's why I like the term bypass track which okay. is actually bypassing this normal fiber our normal let's say conduction system uh, then it may cause uh, uh, an, 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 let's say an underlying uh, a vicious cycle or a macro re-entrant circuit uh, and this ability for the for the signal to uh, to go in a circus movement uh, within the additional fiber and the normal system would then lead to a pathological tachycardia and the patient may present with one of the things maybe obviously palpitations. Okay. How common is arrhythmias which is number one and what are the causes or risk factors for a for arrhythmias? Okay arrhythmias are extremely common uh, but may be divided up into those which are uh, let's say benign and which may require no specific medication and those which require uh, treatment. So those are so, the more serious ones? Correct, yeah. Um, I need to mention in particular atrial fibrillation, which is a, a rhythm which is characterized by the fact uh, that we have a very irregular and rapid heart rate. And I'm mentioning atrial fibrillation because not only is it the commonest clinical arrhythmia that we will be fo f faced with, in other words, if I were to have 10 people coming to my rooms with an arrhythmia, the chances at least of 50% having atrial fibrillation is quite high. Okay. Uh, and it, not only is, so it is there the commonest rhythm, disturbance that I see but it is also a rhythm disturbance which is associated with significant morbidity and mortality and hence the commonest procedure that I actually perform is to eradicate uh, atrial fibrillation. Okay so what are the causes for it? Yeah. Actual yeah. So we mentioned, you know, causes for arrhythmias in general. Let's cause. Let's talk about causes outside of the heart. Okay. You may have a thyroid problem, okay. and you may be uh, uh, have excessive thyroid hormone. In other words, you refer to as being thyrotoxic, or hyper, uh, hyperactive thyroid would be would be a bit okay. more descriptive. Um, and because of that, you may present with rhythm disturbances, including atrial fibrillation. People who have underlying structural heart disease. They've had a heart attack before, and the heart muscle is weak. Alternatively, they have diseases of the lining of the heart called pericardial diseases. Alternatively, uh, they may have hypertension, which is extremely common, which is okay. high blood pressure, which causes the chambers of the heart to dilate. Those are all potentially reversible causes of rhythm disturbances. So okay. we have those which are acquired, which we are picking up as we are growing older, okay. uh, age being, for example, one of them, and, and, and which is a non-modifiable risk, risk factor, uh, or those which are, in fact, uh, Kind of we are born with known as a congenital risk factor and an example of that would be the wolf parkinson white syndrome where patients are born with this additional fiber causing short circuits okay. and a fast heart okay rate. so what you're actually saying is the rhythm abnormalities can originate in the heart from the structure itself and they are other diseases and illnesses Absolutely. that can lead to external, you know, external factors health. which may okay. affect the heart to go into, uh, you know, rhythm disturbances. Okay. Electrolyte disturbances so would be another common. When cause. you mean electrolyte, would you yeah. mean issues like maybe a sodium or potassium yeah. or a in, mineral? Yeah, in particular, potassium abnormalities yeah, okay. may, may 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 contribute to rhythm disturbances. Okay. So we've spoken a little bit about atrial fibrillation. Can you just highlight some of the signs or symptoms um, that an individual can present with if they do have a 
abnormal heartbeat or a, 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 a arrhythmia, basically. Yeah. So the commonest symptoms of arrhythmias are those which are related to fast rhythm disturbances, um, uh, where the heart is actually beating very rapidly. And because the blood flow to the, to the brain and other organs may be compromised because of this very rapid heart rate, because the heart doesn't have time to fill and therefore generate enough pressure to create an additional, uh, let's say, amount of blood to be able to go to the body. Um, this therefore presents with uh, palpitation, so the feeling that the heart is racing, a subjective feeling that the, that the heart is racing. Because of this, the patient may feel dizzy or lightheaded. Uh, some patients uh, may also pass out completely. We call that uh, syncope as a result of the okay. rapid heart, heartbeat. Because the heart is beating very rapidly, there may be a demand supply mismatch of blood and patients can, can present with chest discomfort. Okay. Uh, let's say they may even present with angina if they already have a compromised blood flow, which we spoke about on, on our last program. Uh, but uh, I'd like to also mention that unfortunately and occasionally some people may actually present with sudden cardiac death. Okay. Uh, and that the rhythm disturbance may have stemmed from, let's say, a weak muscle. And the first manifestation of the rhythm disturbance is a sudden death. So because of that, symptoms such as rhythm uh, uh, palpitations which are associated with dizziness or which are associated with patients having blackouts are, are, are taken very seriously. It's a very sinister symptom because those may be the patients, especially in the younger children and adults that we see, where patients may, may end up dying suddenly because of a congenital abnormality uh, of, for example, the electrolyte channels within the heart. Okay, so with these signs and symptoms, you how would you confirm it? Uh, just give us, how would you go about confirming okay. that there so, is an so, abnormality? So a number, a number of tests may be done to try and document an arrhythmia. Arrhythmias by their nature are in fact paroxysmal and intermittent. And so because of that may be, uh, you know, e extremely difficult to pick up. So when you mean, uh, yeah intermittent and yeah. what do you that often the arrhythmia may just present for a few seconds or for a few minutes or sometimes for a few hours uh, in particular okay. atrial fibrillation for example may present for quite a long time okay. uh, but you may have other arrhythmias which may present for very short periods of time where by the time the patient presents to the doctor uh, and their pulse is checked it may be normal we, we start off with a normal clinical examination and we also confirm the heart's rhythm by doing a very simple non-invasive and reproducible and cheap test which is called an electrocardiogram commonly referred to by everyone as the ECG okay and so the ECG is the shall I say the gold standard by which a rhythm disturbance is documented if in fact the ECG doesn't show it, we can have a monitor that the patient may wear, which is called a halter monitor, which they may wear, let's say, for a period of time, uh, 20, uh, 24 hours, 48 hours, and hopefully we can catch it then, but often sometimes it doesn't even happen within 48 hours. Uh, these days we have, uh, you know, devices uh, which are very sophisticated, which we can implant underneath the skin known as loop recorders. And these loop recorders are invaluable because for two reasons. One is they have a very long battery life, so the patient may wear it for up to three years and hopefully during that time we'll catch the arrhythmia. Uh, it may also be used as a follow-up to confirm that the treatment that we've given the patient is successful uh, and more importantly it has a symptom activated function whereby an external device is used to click under this device, uh, over, okay. the, uh, over the device under the skin and that marks the spot of the recording. And hence, we can then correlate the patient's symptoms by what we are in fact seeing on the loop recorder, which is printed out on paper. Okay, so there's essentially three ways or three basic fundamental uh, mechanisms. Yes. Like it would be your primary ECG, it yeah. would be then the halter device, Correct. which is the 24-hour one, and yes. then you get the loop recorder. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So those are the three uh, common ways that we can use to, to make a diagnosis, and these are all, of course, um, relatively non-invasive because okay. the only additional test that I've not mentioned where we can in fact induce or uh, really uh, you know try and evoke those rhythm disturbances are a slightly more uh, uh, shall I say um, interventional test or invasive test which is called an electrophysiological study and this is then done within our very specialized electrophysiology laboratory whereby thin narrow flexible tubes which are which are extremely soft uh, known as catheters are then caused from you know the the entrance site which we use which are the groins of the legs and these are slowly then under x-ray vision placed within the heart muscle to try and identify the rhythm disturbance okay. and would you recommend to the public uh, as part of the annual checkup they should have an ecg done as a normal standard routine um, i think ecgs generally 
are probably recommended in particular for those patients who are at risk for cardiac disease. I'm talking about the routine ECG. Yes. In other words, the patient who is diabetic, it's critical to be having an ECG or an efforts test. Uh, for the patient who has a background of hypertension, the ECG is very important. In particular for risk, risk factors. We know that there is underlying cardiac structural disease. Yes, there the ECG is normal. Having it done routinely without any symptoms, uh, I'm not sure that's really necessary. Often if you have a patient who comes in now with palpitations or a symptom suggestive, okay. chest discomfort, lightheadedness, swelling of the legs, then I think the ECG is really an imperative part of your workup for those symptoms. Okay. So now you've confirmed a rhythm abnormality. What's the next step in terms of treatment? Okay, so that's, uh, um, that's, that's one, one, once, once again, it, it's, a, it's a really great question in the sense that um, fortunately the majority of rhythm disturbances that we, that we see and diagnose are in fact treatable. And by treatable, I mean they are in fact curable. Okay, um, so uh, for, a, for a large percentage of the patients who are on medication for their rhythm disturbance, we are able to offer treatment which is known as ablative therapy or ablation or radiofrequency ablation or simply cardiac ablation. And what that is, is we, we identify where the short circuit occurs within this electrical pathway and then we deliberately go and often try and cause very mild damage to the, let's say, the, 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 the tissue housing this abnormal circuit. Okay. And by doing so, we can then cure the, the arrhythmia. Uh, and because these procedures have got a higher success rate, uh, we find that in particular in younger patients, but even in older patients, this is the ideal form of therapy as far as I am concerned. Uh, the reason being many of the medicines that we use to try and control the rhythm disturbances may cause significant side effects. Number one, they may have long-term significant organ toxicity associated with them. And, number, and lastly, they may also be ineffective and patients may be refractory to them. So the procedure may be called a cardiac ablation and the alternative forms of energy that we are giving this ablative therapy with is either thermal energy by which we cause heating damage to the tissue and by, by this I mean a very small area uh, you know, of, of, of insignificant tissue is in fact damaged to control the arrhythmia so it's unlikely that the patient is going to develop some form of uh, you know, damage or further problem from the ablation itself. Uh, this is exceedingly rare. Um, and lastly, the other form of therapy we can give is intense cold therapy, which we call cryoablation. Okay. So you have your medical management, which is with medication. You've got Correct. your thermal and your cryotherapy. What Correct. about pacemakers? Yeah. So I think uh, it's important to mention, uh, as there are certain conditions where the pacemaker facilitates the management. Uh, let's say for a patient who has refractory atrial fibrillation and despite selective atrial ablation or what we call left atrial substrate modification which is ablation within the left atrial and right atrial chambers we are unable to control the rhythm disturbance so this is in particular for people who have been refractory to all forms of therapy so they're going through the entire stage we've from, done from, the from normal ab ablation we've tried medication they've developed side effects to the mod medication they find the medication intolerable etc in that particular setting we may actually provide the patient with a pacemaker and we can then willfully, purposefully and deliberately destroy the connection between the upper and the lower chambers with a very, very small, very limited ablation called an AV node ablation. Okay. And this is called an ablate and paste strategy. And when we do that, none of those rhythm disturbances from the top chambers is able to reach the lower chambers. But in order to do that, we must first place an artificial pacemaker lead because obviously once no message comes to the lower chambers, the heart okay. doesn't beat. So and the pacemaker is actually then, you know, taking over the beating of okay. the heart. In simple terms, for the viewer, what does a pacemaker actually do, or what is a pacemaker? Okay, it is an uh, you know electrical uh, device which is placed subcutaneously, so essentially below the skin, okay. uh, with uh, electrical pacemaker leads which then convey this electrical message to the heart muscle and these are inserted via the veins we are essentially able to to uh, navigate the veins and place them within the within the um, the heart muscle a pacemaker doesn't require any large form of surgery or opening of the chest and neither does obviously ablation therapy and what this pacemaker does essentially the pacemakers have got multiple functions depending on the kind of pacemaker the basic kind of pacemaker is able to make a heart rate which is very slow quicker okay, okay. ablation can cannot do that. It cannot make a slow heart rate quick. Okay. In order for us to do that, we need to pace the patient. Okay. Ablation, however, can make a very fast heart rate slower, as we've already discussed, or put the heart back into a normal rhythm. That's the basic kind of pacemaker you get. But then you get two other kinds of pacemakers. One of them, which may be a life-saving device, which is able to identify malignant, very 
uh, uh, dangerous rhythm, heart rhythm disturbances, which they're able to shock the patient of, which is called an ICD or an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. And lastly, we have another form of pacing, which is called CRT or cardiac resynchronization therapy, where the pacemaker is specifically used to try and strengthen a heart muscle which has been damaged or for which the timing or synchronicity, synchronicity of the heartbeat is in fact effective. Okay, so you could say that the pacemaker is a separate control center that regulates and monitors the heart and there's different forms of it. Absolutely, I think that is a beautiful description. For okay, yeah. okay. Uh, now the patient has been diagnosed, he's been managed, can he or she lead a normal life? Yeah, this is the whole, uh, you know, I think drive behind electrophysiological procedures because the cure rate of what we do is often so high. Let's say the common rhythm disturbances, what we call the supraventricular tachycardias, uh, for which the nodal reentrant tachycardias or AVNRT and lots of people who would have read may have come across that term, uh, we see in about 60% of patients. Now the cure rate for such a rhythm disturbance is in excess of probably 98, 99%. Um, you know, there are very few therapies in medicine which can give you a cure rate, uh, you know, with such a high sensitivity and specificity, uh, such a high success rate. So the drive behind EP is to get patients off medicines, number one, and number two, to try and restore and return them to as normal a lifestyle uh, as possible, which makes the job, you know, extremely satisfying and gratifying. Okay. Um, so I'll give you a simple example of a child who comes to see me with palpitations and she's performing ballet and uh, she passes out every time she's, she's exercising. So it's very traumatic for the patient's parents to see her like that. It's extremely traumatic for the patient and the medicines we give the patient is, makes, makes her extremely unwell and lethargic and she's unable to, do, to actually do anything let alone focus at school. We diagnose the rhythm disturbance, it's a WPW syndrome, it's an additional fiber, we cauterize it and that's the end of the story. She stays off the medication and it returns to her ballet and you know let's say harmony is restored. Okay. And this is the, I would say in the majority of cases okay. where, in particular where we're not dealing with very difficult persistent rhythms due to structural heart disease. So your, your quality of life is maintained Absolutely. In, that, in that aspect. Absolutely. Okay so it's about managing the arrhythmia correctly and appropriately and allowing you to carry on with your activities of daily living. Absolutely. Okay. To return to the things that you love to do before the arrhythmia, you know, let's say uh, debilitated or severely incapacitated That's your normal lifestyle. Yeah. Okay. So you would say that one, if you are suspecting it needs to be managed on or it needs to be managed at a very early stage to prevent complications. Yeah, I think generally gen rhythm disturbances when, when they are diagnosed one has to ascertain are they dangerous or not. Is okay. it something which the patient may comfortably tolerate and live with or not? Uh, how is it affecting the patient's quality of life? Uh, you know, what kind of treatment is needed? Okay. Uh, what are the risks or complications of such a treatment? You know, in so you know there are many other you know the patient's age etc. But for the most part the symptoms that I've mentioned should be investigated uh, and such a patient should be seen either by their physician uh, or cardiologist and ultimately as an expert in the field um, who is an, you know, a cardiac rhythm disturbance specialist known as an electrophysiologist. Okay. Dr. Gopal, it's been a pleasure having you in the studio once again. Uh, we hope to speak to you again in future episodes. Thank you very much for watching. Stay tuned for another episode next week, same time, same place.